you know, a good place to get some gazpacho. The second installment in the franchise of DreamWorks' most fearless feline phenomenon was an absolute hit. DreamWorks nailed all of their trademarks of excellent animation, brilliant humor, genius takes on fairy tale characters, and a villain that puts fear into the hearts of even the most stoic of viewers. With a movie this excellent, the theories were bound to pile on and pile on they did. Today, we comb through the best and the worst of these theories to decide which ones are absolute truth bombs and which ones are just plain BS. Cannot live enough to the legend. Let's start with the first category. These theories either have so many holes that they can't possibly be true, they lack evidence, or they've been confirmed false by creators. These theories are BS. Our first theory is Shrek is dead during the events of the movie. We know, we know, it's not a theory we're big fans of either, but it's worth taking a look at. As we know, the first Puss in Boots movie acted as a prequel to the events in the Shrek movies. However, this iteration of Puss in Boots is an older, wiser version of the character. How do we know this? Well, we're told that he is on his ninth and final life, and has died eight times already, and it must have taken a while for someone as skilled as Puss to die eight times. Relax, I am Puss in Boots! Oh, and his long white beard that only an old person would have. But, you know, mainly that other stuff. Anyways, we know, with the help of Tom, Tumblr, that at the end of the Shrek movies, Puss is around 13 years old. It's obvious between the end of those movies and the start of this one, a lot has happened. At the end of those movies, Puss and Shrek were still good friends. Shrek even makes a cameo in the movie in the form of a memory, along with Donkey that Puss reminisces upon. However, that memory begs the question, why is Shrek not in the movie? After all, it's not like this movie is a standalone affair, he does exist in this universe. And the fact that Puss does not even consider going to him for help is kind of like Shrek 4 with everyone. It just doesn't sit well with us. It's just out of the question that Puss wouldn't consult the help of Shrek and his other friends. Shrek's final performance? And when you consider that, the possibility of Shrek being dead is not so ridiculous anymore. But as much as this theory makes sense to us, we can't back it up with any solid evidence. What's more, there happens to be evidence against this, since at the end of the movie, Team Friendship is making their way to Far Far Away to meet some old friends. And unless they're on their way to meet the Muffin Man, we just got teased a fifth installment of Shrek. For this alone, we're gonna rank this theory in the BS category. Which is fine, because we don't want to think of Shrek being dead. Moving on from the BS, these theories still have a lot of problems, not enough to say they're completely debunked, but still. These theories are full of holes. Next we have Perito's Second Chance at Life. Okay, let's get the insane stuff out of the way first. We came across this fan theory about Perito on Reddit by user NeatName69. The theory suggests that Death took Perito's soul but decided to give him a second chance at life. Death returns Perito to life but in a different vessel, and he finds himself in purgatory. Death then sends Perito to Puss to test both of them. So, what do you want? Perito represents purity and innocence, while Puss is more reckless and unrestrained. So, it's like death is putting their moralities to the test. And to dive deeper, the map scene in the movie symbolizes the different paths Perito foreshadows. This theory makes sense because when you look at it, Perito is the biggest catalyst for change in Puss's life, even more so than the fear of death. Perito follows Puss around when he doesn't want him there, and then shocks Puss when Puss realizes that his path to the star is peaceful and calm because he doesn't have a wish. You hold him up. Something that becomes extremely relevant later in the story. He also soothes Puss out of his anxiety attack and convinces him to apologize to Kitty. Such great advice could come from innocence or the wisdom of having lived a fulfilled life already. At the end of the movie, Perito is having such a great time that Death decides to let him be with Puss. However, the theory extends to a possible Shrek 5. If Puss passes away in Shrek 5, 
The theory suggests they will both ascend to heaven together. As much as we love this theory, and we love it, it was taken from Reddit and there isn't any direct evidence to support it. Plus, the idea of poor little Perito being a wise sage instead of a cute puppy just doesn't make sense to us. The whole reason his path is the easiest and why he is able to inspire change in Kitty and Puss is because he is just that sweet of a character. And no after-death shenanigans teach you how to be that adorable. With that said, we're now into the middle category, where we may be stumbling onto some truth, maybe. These theories are possible. Moving on to, Puss and Boots should already be dead. Now, we are aware that the rules of real life probably do not apply in the Shrek universe. Talking animals, magical powers, and the physical embodiment of death are pretty obvious markers that this is not the real world. However, a cat is still a cat. No. And if we humor this theory from MatPat for a minute, then it stands to reason that Puss in Boots should have died multiple times in this movie before death comes to collect him. First and foremost, Puss in Boots is an adult cat. He's in the latter stages of life, but still has a youthful spirit. Do you know what isn't youthful? His intestines lack the enzyme lactase that absorbs the sugar from milk. All adult cats are lactose intolerant, and according to MatPat, one glass of milk is the equivalent of one full-size pizza for Puss. With the amount of milk Puss drinks in this movie, he should already be dead. Think about the scene before he meets death for the first time. He's sitting at a bar, downing glass after glass of milk. He's already had eight glasses and is drinking his ninth. Now, imagine a lactose intolerant person eating nine pizzas in a single sitting. There's no nice way to say this, so we'll just say it. Drinking that much leche would straight up kill a cat. The only thing death should have been stumbling upon in that scene is the dead body of Puss in Boots that would be aggressively excreting an unholy amount of feces. No more messing around. Not a pretty sight at all, so yeah. Now, this would be very true in the real world. However, in a world where the side characters are all twisted takes on fairy tale characters and the main character is a talking cat, we all know we have to suspend some amount of disbelief when it comes to analyzing such things. Plus, in the movie, milk seems to make Puss drunk, which means that it isn't destroying his digestive system. Still, since this theory is backed by science, we're going to say it's possible. These next conspiracies make a lot of sense. In fact, we think they're more likely to be true than not. These theories are probable. Next we have Kitty Lies About Santa Columba. Now here's a theory that provides an interesting look into the character of Kitty Softpaws. In the movie, both Kitty and Puss in Boots reference the town of Santa Columba multiple times. These references leave the viewers and Perito both asking the same question. Just what happened in Santa Columba that is the cause of such animosity between these two former feline lovers? Wait, wait, wait what's, what's going on with his eyes? Well, after seeing a vision of death and running away from it, Puss is calmed down by Perito. Puss then tells Perito how he and Kitty were supposed to get married in Santa Columba and how he left her at the altar. He goes on to explain why it was a huge mistake and that he regrets it a lot. All the while, they are both unaware that Kitty had been listening in on their conversation and she is truly moved by what Puss says. It is in that moment that she realizes that he is no longer the hot-headed self-absorbed vigilante, but a much more humble and sober cat. Later, when they're climbing a tree to scout out Goldilocks and her family, Kitty tells Puss that she didn't show up at Santa Columba either. She says that the reason she didn't show up that day was that she knew she couldn't compete with Puss is one true love himself. You don't seem like that guy anymore. This infuriates Puss, but it also helps remove some of the guilt from that incident. However, we find it kind of hard to believe that Kitty wouldn't show up to Santa Columba and still harbor this kind of resentment for Puss. After all, if she felt they both weren't ready, she could have just called the wedding off until later. Furthermore, if she didn't show up, how does she know Puss didn't show up either? The reason the reality of the matter is more likely as such. Kitty did show up to the wedding and was left at the altar by Puss. 
However, after hearing how he regrets that decision more than anything and seeing this new version of him, Kitty's feelings for him resurface and she feels bad for Puss. So, in an attempt to make him feel better, she lies about not showing up either. We feel like this is an attempt at face saving from Kitty, and while she fools Puss, she doesn't fool us one bit. In our estimation, this theory is probable. Finally, we've reached the truth, confirmed truth. People have blown the whistle on these theories with such compelling evidence that they must be true. These theories are the truth bombs. Our first theory in this category is, death isn't actually a wolf. These days, good villains are pretty hard to come by in the media. That's why death from Puss in Boots' The Last Wish was a breath of the freshest air imaginable when it comes to having a compelling villain in animation. Death shows up in the movie right after Puss loses his eighth life. The reason he lost eight of his nine lives was that he lived extremely recklessly. This was shown when after he's down to his last life, Puss refuses to retire because he's no one's lap cat. I am a highly skilled master cat thief. He laughs at the doctor doctor's advice and goes on his way. This does not sit well with one entity in particular, Death, who decides to show this gato who's boss. See, Death finds the entire notion that cats have nine lives an absurd rule in and of itself. Why do cats get nine when every other living person gets just one? But that's not his only problem. After all, death isn't after Kitty's soft paws or any of the cats from that retirement home Puss goes to. No, his problem with Puss is that he does not treat any of his lives with any respect. No need to pull into work. He does not value his life at all. Furthermore, Puss's catchphrase, Puss in Boots laughs in the face of death is the disrespect that, personally, we wouldn't take if we were the physical embodiment of death either. Now, it stands to reason that as cool as death is in the movie, and he is the coolest, it's unlikely that the true form of death is a wolf. After all, this is a fairy tale story where most of the characters are reimaginings of children's stories and poems, and death is clearly the big bad wolf from Little Red Riding Hood. This is backed up by the Universal Studios wiki page, which states that death can take multiple shapes and forms. Wolves are hunters by nature, and it makes sense that as death is chasing puss in this movie, he would take the form of a wolf. This popular theory suggests that this form is tailored specifically to puss. He follows him throughout the movie and stalks him like a hunter stalks his prey. We have heard stories of death taking different forms depending on who he comes for, and so this theory checks out on multiple levels. As such, we think this theory is a truth bomb. Our last theory is the map's true power. The characters in this movie all have one ultimate goal, to secure the map, make their way to the star, and wish for the one thing their heart desires most. For Puss, he is terrified of losing his last life after he realizes he is being hunted down by death and is looking to use the wish to get his other eight lives back. Kitty Softpaws wants the one thing that she has never been able to find her entire life, and that is someone that she can blindly trust without getting hurt by them. Oh, um, yeah, I knew I was gonna do that. Goldilocks and her family are also after the map, and it's because, unbeknownst to her family, Goldilocks wants to wish for a real human family. After all, as much as she loves her family, she doesn't think she belongs with them. Big Jack Horner has been battling with crippling insecurity ever since he's been a kid, and he has been collecting magical items as a substitute for the emptiness he feels in his soul. However, he doesn't feel that emptiness fill up, and so he decides that the only way to do that is to become the holder of all the magical power in the world. They all battle each other for possession of the map that reveals the path to the star. That would grant whoever gets there with the map one wish. That's my wish! The twist here is that the terrain of the forest they must pass through to get to the star shifts on the basis of whoever is holding the map. 
However, there is more to these terrains than just physical obstacles. You see, the map says that it knows the hearts of the people that hold it. This theory states that the true power of the map is not to guide one to the wishing star, but rather to keep them away from it by showing them that they already have that which they seek. Goldie realizes that she already has the perfect family she's looking for. Kitty realizes that she has already found people she can trust blindly in Perito and Puss. Puss finds out that he doesn't need more lives, he just needs to start appreciating the life he has. Oh, and uh, Big Jack Horner doesn't realize any of this and dies because he's just evil. Another similar theory on Reddit suggests that the map itself is the wish and that it grants the wish of whoever bears it, but in a way that makes them thankful for it and learns to appreciate it, instead of passing over it like they did everything else in their lives. This theory, while slightly different, shares the same core idea. The real magic isn't with the star, but with the map. With the way the arcs of all these characters wrap up because of their encounters in the forest, we believe that this theory is spot on and declare it a truth bomb.